Professor Ashish Nandi has been honored with the Hans Killen Award 2019 for his remarkable intellectual contributions to the academic world. We at the press are absolutely thrilled by the news and extend our heartiest wishes to him. To express our gratitude for his association with Oxford University Press and to celebrate this award, I would now like to invite Nico Fund to deliver a brief address in honor of Professor Nandi. This will be followed by a short note from Professor Ananya Vajpayee and Professor Ashutosh Vashne. Well, hello again. Uh, there's a saying in publishing that uh, we want as uh, presses, as publishers, not just to publish books, but to publish authors. Uh, and by that we mean we want to publish people uh, over the, the course of their intellectual journey, uh, over their, the trajectory of their, of their writing lives. And um, while Professor Vajpi will outline some of Professor Nandi's accomplishments in, in more detail, I, I wanted to reflect just very briefly on a few aspects of the uh, very long association between this most arresting thinker and, and Oxford University Press. Professor Nandi's books are uh, an astonishing track record of an intellectual life that spans many disciplines, many eras, many geographies, many methodologies. And it's a, a veritable Rosetta Stone of a polymath intellect, uh, of the kind that I think we see uh, with, increasingly, uh, with increasing scarcity uh, in the academy today, given the, uh, the specialization that we've, uh, we've seen the academy undergo. Beginning almost uh, 40 years ago now, with the publication in 1980 of his book, At the Edge of Psychology, Essays in Politics and Culture, and then extending over four decades uh, and almost a dozen books. Uh, the association between Professor Nandi and the press has been one of the most steadfast and successful of alliances in the history of the press's Indian publishing. From social theory to clinical psychology, from science and technology to Indian classical music, uh, from religion to Indian cinema, from nationalism to secularism, from cricket, which I know the, the bruises are still fresh, so my apologies for the reference there, uh, from cricket to individual, individual and collective madness, and uh, sometimes those things are actually uh, one and the same, I think, here. Uh, Professor Nandi has covered uh, a breathtakingly wide range, uh, and it has been a, a privilege for the press uh, to have been and to be his publisher. I was uh, re-familiarizing myself with uh, a book that you could uh, take a look at out in uh, front here, uh, which is a essentially a, a series of uh, assessments of Professor Nandi's work and the influence thereof uh, in a book uh, that was uh, edited by uh, Professor Vajpayee. And, um, uh, and when you look at some of the, the terms that are used to describe Professor Nandi, uh, they're very impressive. I thought I'd just mention a few of them. Organic intellectual, uh, master of contrarian reason, uh, cognitive storyteller, uh, one of my favorites, meticulous, almost obsessive editor, uh, endearing egalitarian, uh, one of the most original thinkers of our time, and in a, in a pull quote on the front cover, uh, Cornell West refers to him as the France Fanon of our time. Uh, also, as we were discussing last night, uh, you could take a look at uh, four photographs in the photo insert of the book that are uh, Professor uh, Nandi as a baby. So uh, that's a, a particular treat. So with that said, I just wanted to thank you again very much for uh, the many years of the collaboration and uh, turn it over to my colleague. So Ashish Nandi uh, not only needs uh, no introduction, he also needs no awards. Um, we are here to, to celebrate his Hans Killian Award, which was just uh, given to him uh, in May 2019 in Germany. Um, but let me tell you that the honor is ours. It's that of the community of scholars, uh, of his institution, the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, and of his publisher and our publisher, uh, the Oxford University Press. The honor is ours that he has agreed to appear here before 11 a.m on a weekday morning, um, and so graciously to tolerate us going on about him for a few minutes. Uh, so thank you, Ashishda. Um, in 2016, I began preparing an edited volume as a gift to Ashish Nandi on his 80th birthday. I don't want to go into how uncooperative he was uh, with this enterprise, in which I also had a co-editor, Ramin Jahan Beglu. Um, Ashishda, first of all, refused to allow us to call it a fest shift. He didn't want any of the usual suspects contributing. He balked at the idea of a book launch, 
we had a very big one in April 2018. Um, he refused to either make a speech on the occasion or to allow anyone else to make a speech on the occasion. And during the preparation of this volume, <clears throat> I actually spent a lot of time uh, with him going through his books, his papers, his materials and photos uh, at his office, uh, at CSDS, as well as at his home in Nizamuddin. Um, and the only reason I was able to do this, by the way, is because I work in the same office and I actually live next door to him. So reluctantly, but persistently, <laughs> persistence on my part and reluctance on his part, he would permit me to go through everything, but all the time he would just grumble about this exercise. Now, one of the things that he grumbled about the most, <clears throat> as she said, I remind you of this, was the mementos, the trophies, the certificates, and the plaques that actually crowd his space in both his office uh, and at home. So many prizes and awards. It's, it's, you can't even begin to count them. I don't know what to do with these, he would say. It doesn't look nice if I throw them out. <laughs> but where am I supposed to keep them? And how long am I supposed to hang on to them? He would just call, you know, complain about this. So I, I actually I would laugh and I would try to persuade him. And I would say, look, take an indulgent view of it. Uh, you know, let these let these things be these these physical uh, mementos of the various prizes that he had won, because I'd say you know it's important for for people. They want to feel that they've been able to give you a prize, um, and and they feel honored by you agreeing to accept it. It's 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 you know it's as simple as that. And so he would say, okay, fine, you know whatever. There's just I'm, all I'm saying is I have no room left, um, and that was actually quite correct. Um, <clears throat> So when our fresh shift came out uh, last spring, um, he agreed reluctantly to allow OUP to actually include a few photographs, which, uh, which Nico mentioned. Again, not the best portraits of him, of which there are many by very famous photographers over the years, but rather some action shots, as he called them, of uh, events with friends and family and colleagues including some of the prizes he received, uh, like the Fukuoka Prize uh, in Japan, but really trying to deflect attention away from, from himself individually and personally. His friend, the painter Manu Parikh, um, made a portrait of, of Ashish Zah, and with great difficulty, after the painter threw a tantrum, um, basically this went on the front cover of the book, not as Ashish Zah would have it on the back cover of the book, and the painter said, I haven't made this portrait for it to go on the back cover, <laughs> really. Um, so some months ago, um, Ashish Dai and I were at a conference at our center. And we were sort of sitting at a lunch table out in the lawns. It was winter. And there were many eminent scholars milling about. And a lady who I did not recognize came up to us. And she kind of nervously joined our table. And she attempted to broach the subject of buying plane tickets with Ashish Dha, uh, to a small university town in Germany. How do we get you from Delhi to this place? And no mention was made of a prize. She, she, she continually tried to you know, have this conversation with him. And of course, he was not helpful on the matter of dates, on the matter of bookings. Um, he continued ch chatting with me and with others, and he sort of genially, you know, included her into the conversation. Um, this non werkly conversation, which she, she was clearly very uncomfortable with. So finally I said, okay, I'm going to excuse myself to allow this poor woman some chance to, to discuss with him. And I really did not find out until about four months later that what she was trying to do was fly him to the Hans Killian Award Ceremony. Um, uh, and, and that uh, he was about to receive this huge honor um, uh, in, in, in Europe for his extraordinary um, uh, lifetime of work. Um, as you know, Ashish Nandi has spent decades building a repertoire of analytic tools to study Indian society and human civilization more generally in the modern age. He has gifted us a vocabulary for such analysis that draws from his own discipline of psychology, but works across the social sciences. 
um, we see better, we understand better, we think better, because he has devised ways and means of deciphering the phenomena, um, both historical and contemporary, that interest us in our time. <clears throat> if people know two or three Indian names, I think, anywhere in the world from, 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 from uh, you know, the, tw the 20th century, they usually tend to be Mahatma Gandhi, Rabindranath Tagore, and then closer home, Ashish Nandi. Uh, at least in, in, in the academic world, I've, I've discovered this again and again. His ideas of the intimate enemy, of alternative modernity, of um, possibly being anti-secular, with all of the complications of making such a claim, um, the clear difference he draws between nationalism and patriotism, um, the relationship that he has explored between toxic masculinity um, and, and fascism um, well before our present moment when, when both these discourses have come to the fore. These ideas, which we have internalized, which we no longer even attribute to him uh, in, in, in everyday usage, um, these have traveled to China, to Latin America, to Africa, to all across the global south. And um, I just stop by saying that we are in his debt. Um, he does not need any certificates of excellence from us. Thank you, Ashish Dhan. Few very brief remarks from, from me also in felicitation. Um, I was trained in political economy, uh, first at GNU in Marxian political economy, and then at MIT, where within the first three years I outgrew Marxism, first two years I outgrew Marxism, but remained within the field of political economy. Now it became more and more mainstream political economy for me. So when I read The Intimate Enemy, I was shaken. Um, uh, the book was published in 83, but I read it, I think, in uh, 19 when I started working on Hindu-Muslim issues and nationalism, so let's say 93 or 94, 10 years after that, one of its first sentences is, British rule in India was not an exercise in political economy. And it was a very attractive, very uh, sentence that draws you right away. Then I wrote something, so I, it, it, because we're very short of time here, and for the sake of precision, I'll simply read out to you what I made of, the, of, of, of this book and why it was eye-opening for me. British rule in India was not simply a military and political victory. It was also a psychological triumph of sorts. Um, not only India was won as a territory, but Indian minds had also been captured in the first 50 years of East India Company rule, there was no evidence of a colonial ideology. By the 1830s, however, when it safely we assumed that the British rule had come to stay, a full-blown ideology was born. And then this priceless paragraph from the book, let me just cite it. Crucial to this, crucial to the cultural cooptation in India was the, pro was the process psychoanalysis calls identification with the aggressor. Crucial to the cultural cooptation was the process psychoanalysis calls identification with the aggressor. In the colonial culture, um, identification with the aggressor bound the rulers and the ruled in an unbreakable dyadic relationship. The Raj, the British Raj, saw Indians as crypto barbarians who needed to further civilize themselves. It saw British rule as an agent of progress and as a mission. Many Indians saw their salvation in becoming more like the British in friend friendship as well as in enmity. Many Indians saw their salvation in becoming more like the British in friendship as well as in enmity." Unquote. Ashish Nandi, page 7 of The Intimate Enemy. Thank you 
for opening the eyes of this political economist and alerting me uh, to, a, to a world which was indeed, I was convinced, more psychological uh, than an exercise in political economy. So I celebrate this award on behalf of all of us. Thank you. I request uh, Swanima Narayan to come on the stage, please. Um, Nico Fund and Professor Nandi, please be here for a brief ceremony. Nico. Uh, yeah, Ashutosh Vashne and Ananya Vajpayee. Thank you. Um, I now request all of you to join us for tea in the foyer area. Also, uh, some of the best academic titles from the press are for sale outside, so you may kindly have a look at those as well.